Good evening. You're very welcome to this, the seventh installment in this webinar series from myself and my colleagues here in Chagas, Sligo, Leitrim, Donegal. My name is Kean Condon. I'm a dry stock advisor based in Manor Hamilton in County Leitrim, and I'll be your host here this evening. And tonight our focus moves to silage production. And although the event itself won't be taking place for a while yet, your preparation should be beginning shortly. Um, I'm joined by Kevin McMenamin and Patrick Gibbons, both of the Letterkenny office in Donegal. And they'll be covering everything you need to know uh, to maximize both the quality and the quantity of the silage produced on your farm this year. Now, although we can't meet face to face, given the current circumstances, we still want to keep things fairly interactive. And at the bottom of your screen, you would see a question and answer function, and you can send in your questions and comments right throughout this evening's presentations, and I'll put them to our panel towards the end. At that, I think we'll move to begin, and I'll call on Patrick uh, to share his screen. Patrick, are you there? Is that all right? That's perfect. Thanks a million, Pat. Patty, you can go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Hello, uh, my name is Patrick Gibbons. I'm an education officer here based in Chagas in Letterkenny in County Donegal. So tonight, um, Kevin McManaman, my colleague, and myself will be going through, as Keen said, a wee bit on preparing to grow a, a crop of silage. So what I'm going to be looking at is a wee bit on, um, a wee bit on the farm, um, what, what quality of silage we're going to need and how much we're going to need and Kevin is going to tell you how we're going to get there. So, um, look, at, I suppose credit has to be given to Kevin for his photography skills as well. There's there's some great captures from around County Donegal in this this presentation too. So, credit to Kevin for that. So, look, as we said, what, what we're going to cover. Um, so, what quality and quantity do we need? So, I know quality is always something we aspire to, but quantity is something that we... Um, that's a necessity that we need to have. We need, we need to have the, the required silage there to, to get us through the winter as well. Um, the next thing I suppose, making a plan, how are we going to achieve it? Um, you know, so, you know, what, how much ground are we going to need? Um, you know, when are we going to have to cut? That's sort of what, what we'll be looking at there. And I suppose what Kevin's going to be put going is doing is putting that plan into action. So. We're all after hibernating now for the winter, so getting out and getting the slurry out, getting the fertilizer out, and getting the grass growing. So Kevin is going to be going through that, which is so. Look, and I suppose why do we worry about silage, or why why is it so important to us to make good quality silage? Well, look, and I suppose we all hear of the cost of keeping animals and the cost of keeping cows and suckler cows, especially. So you know, on the farm. Feeding, feeding our cows accounts for about 75% of the costs associated with them. So, you know, the cheaper we can feed them and the better we can feed them, the more money that will be left in our pocket or the more money that will stay in our pocket. So what, what are we depending on our silage to do? We're depending on it for a few different things. Well, the first thing there, I suppose, is weight gain. So average daily gain, highly important. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's no good. And if we have young cattle or if we have finishing cattle or, or any stock, it's no good having them standing still. We need to, if they're on the farm, they need to be producing. So, you know, having good quality silage there, it, allow, it allows us to put on weight and grow cattle the cheapest way possible over that winter, winter time. And um, with our dry cows and our yos, it's a matter of maintaining body condition. So we'll be looking a wee bit at what quality of silage do we require to do that? And again, when it comes to maintaining body condition, the yo and the cow are two completely different animals. So silage quality is going to vary for us there too. And I suppose for those on the dairy side of the house, milk production, again, you know, the more milk we can produce from grass and from grass silage, the, the, the cheaper it can be produced as well. So the number one param parameter that we look at when we're, when, when we're talking about silage quality is dry matter digestibility. So when we look at silage, we're looking at the dry matter, but not only are we looking at the dry matter, we're looking at how much of that can we actually use. So the more of that dry matter that we can use, the better, the better our animals is going to do. So look, at I think my next slide here, and I look at as I should have said at the start, don't be afraid if you're logged into this on a phone or an iPad or even the laptop, don't be afraid to take a screenshot or take out the phone and, and, take, and take a picture of it. Um, but look at what our animals are going to need. Um, this, this slide sort of sums it up. 
sums it up fairly well, so it does. So we can see here, starting on the left-hand side, um, sort of this is the top of the food chain. So our freshly calved autumn cows, um, you know, our finishing cattle, our young, our young growing stock. This is where we need our top quality silage. This is where we need our, you know, 72 plus, 70 up to, you know, aiming for 75 DMD silage. An animal that's not on this slide here, but, you know, would be just as important for top quality silage is our yos. Our yos, you know, as you all will be aware this time of year, yos are getting bigger. There's lambs growing inside them. The room for digestion there is getting, it's getting weird, it's getting smaller. So what the feed that's going in there has to be top quality. So there again, our yos, they need the top quality silage too. So our yos, and I suppose on the dry stock side of it, it's, it's our younger stock or our fattening stock. On the dairy side of it, it's our autumn calvers and it's our, it's, it's our weanlands that maybe we've bought in or we've bred. We want to give them the top quality silage. So we're aiming to give them, I look at, I suppose we always aim for 75 DMD, whether we get, get it or not, maybe can be a, a, another thing. Um, moving across to the right, I suppose 70 DMD silage, um, maybe slightly more achievable, but I suppose it's still, still not to be discounted. Still, you know, for, 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 for dry cows, dry suckler cows, that need to put on a wee bit of condition. If we have if we have cows, you know, that have calved in the past couple of months producing the milk and that, you know, the, the like of this 70 DMD silage, I, ideal for the like of that stock. Um 68 DMD silage, you know, if we if we if we're milking cows and they're in the shed dry over the winter time, we're hoping when they calve down that we're going to get them out the grass. You know, if we're happy with condition and things like that. 68 DMD silage will, will, will keep them motoring. They'll gain a wee bit of condition, but it'll it'll keep them right. 66 DMD silage is sort of the other end of the scale. Look at if we have if we have sucked our cows that we're putting into the shed and we'll say the month of October with a body condition score of somewhere around you know three and a half, 66 DMD silage, that'll keep them going rightly. Um, you know, it'll 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 uh, it'll it's you know it's it's maybe there's 66 DMD silage. There's going to be a bit more bulk there. It'll keep them going rightly. I suppose, look at you, that graph. It's grand and it's fine to look at it. But, you know, actually out on the farm, when it comes to, when it comes to implementing it, um, what's actually out there? What, what are farmers working with? Um, there was a study carried out from Grange and was put together in 2014 where they travelled the country from Cork to Donegal over two years taking samples of silage from, from different types of farms and different sizes of farms and all that. And it was found that the national average silage quality was 62 DMD. So it's still 4% 4, 4 4 short of even maintaining the suckler cow. So, you know, you put suckler cows into a shed with 62 DMD quality silage. If you put them in, we'll say at, at a condition score of, of three and a half, they're going to be coming out thinner. They're going to be thinning down. So, you know, 62 DMD silage, that's what, I suppose, if you're not, if you're not getting your silage sampled and you don't know what it is, but if you, if you are getting your silage sampled and you know what it is, so much the better, but there's, you know, that, okay, there'll be farmers doing a lot better, but again, that's what the na national average is. So with that in mind as well, that means that there's worse out there too. So there's everything probably from 55 DMD upwards. But um, you know, th th this is something that we need to work on. And look, at that's, that's what I'm going to be looking at now in my next couple of slides, is what we can actually save by making better quality silage. So look, at in, in, in the region we're in, you know, um, look at a, a typical sort of a farming scenario that, that I've sort of, that myself and Kevin have been, have been thinking about is maybe a farmer with 20 suckler cows, maybe holding on to the Wainlands, 100 yos running around the place as well, sort of, it's it's sort of you know we're, we're working with students here and look at that's a lot of sort of what what we're seeing sort of situations similar give or take a wee bit but uh, similar to that so we've done out here a few sort of calculations based on these 20 cattle in the shed over the winter so the first group of stock we're going to take into account is our, is our 20 wainlands so our 20 wainlands in the shed over the winter getting our national average 62 dmd silage um in order to keep them growing at a rate of, we'll say, average daily gain, and we'll say 0 0.6, 0 0.5 uh, kilos per day, it's going to take nine ton of meal. Over, over a five-month winter period, 
that's going to cost us two thousand seven hundred euros on on, uh, on 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 twenty wavelengths. If we can jig things around a bit, get the fertilizer out a wee bit earlier, you know, get the ground closed up a wee bit earlier, we can reduce that back to three ton a meal, and we can cut that back to nine hundred euros. So that's a saving there. That's a saving of somewhere around sixteen hundred euros. So look, I, I don't have to tell you, you know, the, the whole thing with 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 beef production and suckler production, weaning production. Margins are tight, you know. There's no one. There's no huge fortune in it, but. Definitely, if, if silage quality is poor and we're give right now a bigger check for meal than we'd like to be, you know, it's, it's going to leave margins even tighter. Um, on the finishing side of it, again, 20 bullocks finishing in the shed over the winter. Um, you know, 62 DMD silage. So again, this is our, our national average silage. It's going to take 27 tonne of meal there. It's going to cost us 7,300 euros. If we can improve silage quality, bring it up to, you know, Bring it up to 72 DMD, which, which is achievable. Um, you know, 15 ton of meal, we're, we're nearly half on our, our, our quantity of meal, and we're well, we're not quite half on the meal bill, but we're 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 knocking 3,300 euros off it anyway, which is a which is a brave chunk of money as well. So look at that's on the cattle side of it again. Look at you know, it just it just goes to show cattle, you know, improving silage quality, you know, it can it'll it, you know, it's it's we're making silage anyway. We're spreading the fertilizer. It's just about getting the timing right, you know, and, and, and putting out, feeding the ground with what it needs, you know. It's it's just about getting that right. On the sheep side of it, look at there, it's it's becoming more and more common for sheep farmers to, you know, to give ground a wee bit of a rest. Sheep farmers are people with sheep that sheep are being housed. Um look at it in general, there, you know, when we're housing sheep, we're talking about maybe a two and a half month winter. So sheep are being housed from um from we'll say the 1st of January up until around now, up until about the middle of March, we're hoping to get them out to a bit of grass after they lamb. Um, you know, good quality silage, what good quality silage can do for us there. So we'll say on our 100 yos, so between between um, between Christmas time, or between the first between the new year and now, our 100 yos will have on, on poorer quality silage, um, on poorer quality silage, will have had about four tonne of meal. That'll stand us about 1,300 euros. If we can improve our silage quality, again, we can half that back to, you know, about a ton and a half or two ton of meal. What I would say about the sheep is, you know, there's no hard and fast rule there. If the oats are in poorer condition, we're going to have to implement, come in with the meal a wee bit earlier and we're going to have to try and, and build up our yos a wee bit so we aren't hit with twin lamb disease. Again, look at the sheep, I suppose, the, the, the area that they have for digestion, it's a lot smaller, so we probably have to, to look after them that wee bit better and, and, and watch them a wee bit better. Um, look at, I suppose, the thing with, with sheep as well, you know, not, not to be mistaken, that's that's sort of pre-lambing. Um, Post-lambing, you know, if, if, if you're feeding there, well, that's going to depend on grass supply, but that's a, that's a topic for a, for a different meeting, I suppose. But that's, that's look at, I suppose, the saving that's to be made there in 100 euros. It's, it's 800 euros. Look at, it's it's definitely, look at it, it's, it's two tonne of fertilizer, or it's, it's it's money that's better in your pocket than than being wrote in a, in a meal check anyway. So it is. On the dairy side of it, look at dairy cows this time of year. Um, look at we're probably there's probably going to be you know we're we're, we're dairy cows after calving. We're building up the peak yield. We're trying to get cows into good condition for breeding and things like that. Again, you know the meal feeding side of it with the dairy cows. Um, we're probably we're, we're probably going to be feeding the meal anyway. But I suppose the, the impact of good quality silage. Um, the impact of good quality silage, you know, it can be the difference there in about six litres. Um, look at, I'm not going to start saying what that's worth. The dairy farmers will, will, will be able to work that out anyway. But, um, you know, it, it just goes to show, you know, having that excellent quality silage, what it is worth, you know, look at 79 DMD, that's, that's exceptional quality. But look at this, was this DMD... How we go about achieving this, this higher DMD silage? What a lot of it has to do is the growth stage of the plant. So the growth stage of the plant, um, as, as the year goes on, the grass plant goes through its growth stages. But look at what, what it's all about for making good quality silage is putting leafy silage into the bales or putting leafy silage into the pit. When that stem starts to harden up or the seed head starts to emerge, you know, quality starts to just go in the in, in the wrong direction. So you can see here from from, from this table here, 
um, you know, 76, 74 DMD silage, you know, you're, you're looking there at silage, you know, sort of a, you know, it's, 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 it's a three, four leaf stage, you know, we're not going to have huge bulk there. It's, that's going to be short leafy stuff. Um, but the quality is, is going to be massive. Um, to put a date on the like of that there, you're probably for, I know for, for Donegal, you know, you, you'd be looking probably somewhere around the 20th of May for the like of that. Again, as we, as we move over to the right, the seed head starts to emerge. You know, we're, we're, we're sort of going into the end of May. And as we move across, we're going into June. And um, you can see there, look at, you know, there's a full stem and a full seed head there at 67 DMD. So, you know, when we're at the national average of 62 DMD, there's bound to be nearly a second growth starting to starting to appear. So, you know, it's, it's about getting in at the right stage um, and, and, and being able to cut. But I suppose the big, I suppose the big fear with farmers always is cutting too early. We're losing bulk. We're wasting money paying the contractor. But as I'll show you later on, with, with adequate soil fertility, with proper soil fertility, you know, bulk, you know, that's, it's going to be there for us as well. That's, that's not going to be a problem. So um, look at, you know, we're, we're talking away about planning and making the plan. So again, if you are on the phones or if you are on the iPads, this might be another one worth taking a wee screenshot of, especially that middle column there, tons per month. So, you know, it's, it's often something that farmers say, you know, I've, I've, I've 20 cows, how much silage am I going to need to feed them? Um, I have, I have 20 weanlands, how much silage will they require of, of 100 yos, how much silage are they going to require? So look at the table we have done up here is, um, look at the, the, uh, the table that we have done up here is, is for taking into account suckler cows, beef bred weanlands or, or lowland yos. So um, our suckler cows, they're going to require about 1.4 tons a month of sort of medium quality silage. I won't say, look at, you know, you know, the, the, the minimum that we want to be make is, is, is medium quality silage, you know, so we, it's, it's no good putting animals into a shed and them losing condition and silage, you know, they have to be fit to, to maintain where they are. So, you know, 1.4 tons a month of our, say, our, our 65 to our, say, 60, 66 DMD silage is, is, is what we need for our suckler cows. Our weanlands, as we said, our weanlands, um, we want to keep them thriving. We need to keep them growing over the winter. Every kilo they can put on, that's a kilo more that they'll have when they're going to the mart. That's another maybe a 10 or 20 euros in our pocket. So, you know, we need to keep them thriving on over the winter, the winter period. Our yos, as we said, our yos are tricky boys because, you know, the lambs are growing inside them and the room for that stomach is getting smaller. So what's going in there has to be good quality. So it does, has to be high dry matter, has to be good quality. So, you know, um, it's you know, important figures there to remember when you're, when you're figuring out how much, how many acres will I need to cut, how much ground will I need to close. Well, your suckler cows will need 1.4 tons a month, your weanlands will need 0.7 tons a month, and your yos will need 0.15 tons a month. So look at myself and Kevin worked it out there earlier on, um, you know, tons per head over over the winter period. For our cows there, we were sort of look at okay, maybe we were we were we were erring on the side of caution, but we said a six month winter. For our weanlands, we said a, 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 a five month winter. So maybe we're getting them away to the mart um, a wee bit quicker, or we're getting them out to graze off the silage ground or something like that. And for our yos, we were saying about a sort of a two and a half month winter. So it's you know we're, we're taking the month of January the month of February and, and half the month of March, and hopefully we're getting them out to a bite of grass with their lambs. Um, so that's sort of, that leaves us then with our, with our 20 cows, we're going to need 170 tonnes for them. With our 20 weanlands, you know, for the five month winter, we're going to need 70 tonnes for them. And for our 100 yos for the two and a half month winter, we're going to need, um, we're going to need 40 tonnes of silage for them. Again, look at breaking it up there, 170 tons of medium quality silage for the cows. It's only a matter of maintaining them, keeping the wee bit of flesh on their back. Um, with, with our weanlands and with our yos, we need, that's where we need the, the, good, the good quality stuff. That's where we need the, 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 real, the real good quality stuff. So, you know, we're, we're going to need about 110 tons of, uh, of, 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 we'll say, excellent quality silage. So again, look at make, making a plan, what area are we going to need to make that or what area 
you know, is that going to take up on their farm? How much, how much ground are we need, going to need to close off? So look at it, if, if we take our cows maybe first, um, our cows is probably the biggest, the, you know, the biggest demand for feed on the farm. So as we said, we need 170 tonnes. You know, look at, on a lot of dry stock farms, you know, where we were working off here was having a yield of about, um, of about 10, 10 tonnes of fresh weight per acre. Um, you know, so look at, on unrece- unreceded swarts, um, it probably is possible to, to do a wee bit better than that. But, you know, and, and again, on a lot of dry stock farms, that's what we're looking at is sort of um, a fresh grass yield with a, maybe an older perennial ryegrass sort of t- 10 tonnes um, ten tons per, per acre. So look, in order to achieve that, um, we're, we're going to say it's 66 DMD silage. What we need to be aiming towards there is cutting the 10th of June and closing the middle of April. Um, now look at 10th of June, you know, middle of April, maybe we should be saying mid-June and mid-April. You know, look at setting your calendar exactly for the 10th of June. Sure enough, if you say I need to cut the silage on the 10th of June, you'll open your NO and it'll be um it'll be raining for two or three days around then. So look at if the weather's coming good on the 6th, 7th, 8th of June, I'd be going in with the mower, I'd be getting it knocked, getting it into the pit or getting it into bales. Again, if it's if if the weather's bad, if ground is wet, again, look at what can you do. You just have to leave it and you have to you have to work with work with what the, work with what you have. Again, look at closing ground. That means closing the gate, you know, going in with the slurry, waiting a wee while. Look at Kevin's going to be dealing with that anyway. I suppose closing ground for silage, we would always be hoping and we would always be aiming that we would have the silage ground grazed before we would close it. Again, look at grazing the silage ground. It's great to have a pick for, you know, the lake. if we could get the lake of our wainlands out to it, it'd clean them up before selling them. They'd thrive great at grass. If we had yo lambs or if we had yos, we could get to it to get it grazed off. Um, it doesn't matter grazing it off in the autumn or grazing it off early in the spring. Whenever you can graze it off, it's, it's going to make a good job of it. The other thing about grazing off and, and, and cleaning your, your, your meadow before you go fertilizing it is, you know, when, it, when it's cleaned off, you'll have nice fresh growth, nice fresh young grass. The sunlight will be able to get in the, at the base of it and it'll be able to grow. You know, you, you'll have far better growth there as well. As we said, our, our, our wainlands and our, and our yows, we're hoping maybe we'd have a bit of better quality stuff for them. So 110 tons we said we need here. We're working off, you know, uh, um, for, for, for making this good quality silage. We're going to be cutting a wee bit earlier. Um, so, you know, we're working maybe with maybe moderate soil fertility and, you know, fields that maybe haven't been receded in, in, in the past maybe 10 years. So yield is going to be back a wee bit here. So we're working off sort of a fresh rate of eight ton per acre here. So in order to feed these wainlands and to feed the yews, we would need about 14 acres closed up. Um, again, when are we going to close that up? Late March, early April. So look, at you'd want to be thinking about it now soon, get in there, get it closed up and cutting, cutting around the 25th of, of, of May. I suppose the question that's always there or the, the, the query that we always have is about, you know, how is, um, you know, quality versus quantity we can overcome that with soil fertility. So, do you know, there, there's always that argument out there, do you know, with, with a lot of farmers, you know, all, you know, that, that fell out cutting the 1st of June, he's only cutting coffins, you know, there's, there's nothing in the field. If we have our fields at the right levels for P and, and K and, and lime, lime requirements meeting where, where they need to be and put on enough of nitrogen, there's, you know, th- th- this graph just illustrates it. So you, you can see there clear enough um, it, it, with, with good soil fertility, we can have the exact same yield on the 26th of May as we do on the 16th of June. And look, at that's, that's about 10% uh, DMD in the difference as well. So um, look, at with, with, without, without saying too much more, um, I'm going to hand over to Kevin. So look, at I, I hope if you have any questions at the end, we'd be more than happy to answer them. Um, but look at I, you know, hopefully you have a wee idea now in your heads, you know, what quality of silage you're going to need, um, how much of it you're going to need, what area is going to be required to do that. What Kevin is going to tell you is now is how to grow them crops, how to fill the silage trailers and how to, how to, to have crops of bales that, that, that people will be, that you, that you can brag about. So that's, so I, I'll, 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 I'll stop me share here, Keen, is it?
Yeah, that's great. Thanks very much. If you want to stop sharing there, please, yeah. Patrick, and um, we'll move straight ahead. So, Kevin, if you're ready, you can put on your camera there. And uh, just want to test, can we hear you there, Kevin? Hello, yeah. 100%. So, if you want to share your screen there, please, Kevin, and we'll move straight ahead. And just before you start there, I'm just going to um, just remind people that we do have the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. I can see a, a, a nice few questions tipping in already. Uh, please feel free to send in your questions and comments right throughout, and um, I'll put them to Patrick and Kevin towards the end. You can fire ahead there, Kevin. Thanks very much. All right. Uh, thanks, Kian. Thanks, Patrick. Um, well, I suppose my, my name is Kevin McMenamin, uh, based here in Letterkenny as well, just for no... Um, I suppose to do to do the introduction properly, um, and, and look at we'll, we'll we'll take on the baton and, and from from where Patrick left off. So, I see you click that again. There we go. So look at what are we going to cover? I suppose Patrick has covered the first two points very well, um, and I suppose the the point I'm kind of coming in on here now is, is kind of putting this plan into action. So, um, what do you call it? You know, the, the, the first thing or the first point is, is to maybe pick the fields that you're that you're going using. Um, look, I know in a lot of farms, you know, the, the, the silage fields are probably kind of fixed. Um, you know, the cleanest fields for cotton or whatever, the handiest uh, to the yard or whatever. But, you know, bear in mind maybe what Patrick was saying, you know, about, about the quality and, and maybe trying to cut that wee bit earlier. And look, at if, if it is a case you have a choice of fields, you know, pick the ones that are going to respond or that you're going to be able to, to operate on if you are going for a bit of, a bit of very good silage um, for, for younger stock or whatever. Um, so just, you know, picking your fields is, is, is very important. And I have this here in the bottom right, you know, about soil sampling. Um, what do you call it? You know, it's, it's still, if, if you haven't spread slurry or any P or K, you, you know, you still would have an opportunity to take samples and, and maybe... Look, you may, you still might have a bit of time to do something about it. Um, for for cotton silage, is probably the, the time's probably a wee bit shorter on it now. But look, it's definitely, uh, definitely a good idea. You know, to go go and take them and, and start making a plan for whether it's going to be for this year or for next year or for later in the year, or whatever. Um, so picking your fields is the first first step. Look at slurry and fertilizer next. I'm going to come in on them now in a wee minute. Um, and I suppose after that, then you have kind of a bit of management. Um, I suppose kind of management of the crop or management of the land, I suppose you could say, and, and the last step then look cutting and, and getting it into the pit or the bales. Um, so look at the first step is slurry. Um, you know, getting it on in good time, getting it kind of washed in, not washed off, but washed in. Um, and look at, I suppose this would have been the kind of fairly traditional outfit, splash plate. Um, up, up to now, and look, at, I'm sure there's probably dairy farmers in the call or intensively stocked maybe beef or sheep farmers and derogation um, and, and look at those folks maybe are going to be moving on to maybe something more like this now um, these kind of low emission uh, low emission slurry spreading machines so you know one of the upsides of the, those I suppose you get a wee boost in terms of nitrogen so for every thousand gallons of slurry that you put on you're gaining roughly three units of, of nitrogen the P and K stays the same but you'll gain a few units of nitrogen um, look at slurry going on at this time of year, you know, you can see there, look at that, that field in particular, that's sort of fairly ideal in terms of what we'd be looking for to close off for silage, you know, nice, clean, the field's cleaned off, um, it's a clean sward, um, look at it, it's been nicely grazed down, but it's still kind of green to the butt, there's no dead material, so that's sort of what we'd be looking for um, to, to kind of close off for silage. Um, I suppose the next part, look at again, as Patrick was saying, if you're on a smartphone or even you have a camera or something, you can you can uh, maybe take a photo of the like of this table. Basically what it is, it's uh, giving you kind of financial values for, for different, you know, slurries and, and, and dung. Um, so maybe just just for a, for a, for a quick kind of a run around it, look at you have cattle slurry here based on, on book values. You have kind of actual values. I'm going to touch on that again in a wee minute. Um, you have your pig slurry and, and you have your farmyard manure or, or longstead manure. And over on the right here, um, you have a, a kind of a euros per thousand gallons value or value per ton. And brackets there, look at you'll have, uh, you have kind of units per thousand gallons there in brackets. And, and look at we're kind of based all this stuff in units because it's what most people would work with. Um, so look at that's one there. You can, you can maybe take a, a screenshot or a picture or whatever of that. 
or if you're watching it back later, you can you'll you'll be able to see it. Um, the next step, look at the slurry is on. Um, you know, giving it maybe a week or ten days, get the slurry washed in a couple of showers of rain, or give it a chance to dry in. Um, and I'm coming back with a fertilizer. The reason that we wait that week or ten days is fairly simple. When you put on slurry, there's nitrogen in it. When you put on fertilizer for silage or for, well, for anything, you're putting on nitrogen. And if you have two, you know, two sources of nitrogen coming together, they're going to clash and you'll have losses. Um, it'll, it'll just basically, as it was evaporate for the for for the for the purposes of this conversation, it'll, it'll just kind of basically evaporate. So, uh, give it a week or ten days. Um, come back with your fertilizer, and I suppose this part now is kind of starting to tie it together. So, um, what we've done here, look at there's there's any amount of tables there available. Look at if you're searching on your phone or in the computer, you know, look at Jagus. There is a heap of information there on. Uh, fertilizer programs, but for the purposes of this, we kept it simple. Um, the first two kind of columns here, um, we've, we've kind of we've, we've made a wee plan where there's slurry going on, and on the right here, we have no slurry going on, and what maybe what you can do there. The important thing to look at down the left here, the main three elements we're looking to put on your, your N, P, and K, and we have in wee brackets here below them the, the units to the acre roughly that you need to be putting on. Now, there's a wee bit of a health warning with this. Uh, these limits, we've picked the ones kind of for uh, index one and two soils for the simple reason that about nine out of 10 soil samples are lacking that come in. And, you know, typically we were talking earlier on about this today, the advisors, and look at without fail, you know, a lot of soils and, and you know, Donegal, Sligo, Leitrim, dry stock farms, you can, you can widen this out, um, are lacking. You know, predominantly, look, we will be dealing with index one and two soils. If you're index three, great and more power to you, or index four. Um, but we can affect index one and two because it's, there, there's a lot of those out there in silage ground. The reason that we picked that is this first column here in the left. Um, I have a wee star here, you might note diluted slurry. And look, there's a lot of that, you know, especially with pipeline systems, it has to be diluted down to flow through them and even to agitate, you know. Um, you know, ordinary ordinary tanks, we'll say, you know, maybe unless you're a dairy farmer with washings going into the tank, you know, if you're a beef or a sheep farmer, look at it, it's going to be fairly thick stuff and definitely you're probably not going to be working with book values for it. So the reason we, we put this in was simply 2,000 gallons to the acre would be a common kind of an application rate and three bags of nitrogen would be a fairly, um, you know, common application rate as well. The reason we put this in and the reason these two boxes are in red um, is the P and K levels. All three of these programs are giving you your 90 units of nitrogen. Now look at a 80 to 100, you can balance it up whatever way you like, um, but you know, we, we can uh, balance them all for 90 units of nitrogen, which is a happy medium. But the P and K levels, there's red lights flashing here. And the simple reason we have that up is a lot of farmers are working with diluted slurry, putting on 2,000 gallons to the acre, and putting on something a high nitrogen with maybe low or no P to K, P and K products, you know, low, low to none, um, P to K, P and K, sorry, uh, fertilizers. So, you know, something like can, um, a three bag staker, you're coming back doing this year on year, and eventually we end up with the type of soil samples we're after talking about, you know, continually running down the field. And look, there's only so many times that you can go to the well before it runs dry. So the reason we put in these wee programs on the right, look at a lot, lot, a lot of folks will have slurry. Um, and then there'll be other folks that maybe don't have slurry or don't even have access to slurry or no way of handling it. So again, both programs, 90 units of nitrogen. Um, and I suppose after that, then it's, it's the type of fertilizer. So four and a half bags, 18, 6, 12 will be a pretty good balance. You have your 90 units of nitrogen, but your P's and K's, look at you're coming up here, you're, you're nicely into the into the bracket of where you would like to be. So that's why we coloured them in green. You're, you're not depleting the soil, putting that on. And that's the basic message of that table. On the right hand side, you know, no slurry, three bags of 0730 plus nitrogen. And that can be, look at it, can be three or four bags of can, it can be protected urea or whatever it might be. 
that can be whatever form and ethogen you, you, you please. Um, we picked 0730, look at it, it's, it, historically it would have been a very popular compound. It's probably fallen by the wayside, but again, look at it's available if you ask for it. Or again, look at you could make that up with 10, 10, 20 and, and change your rate of nitrogen. So you can kind of take your pick from that. And that's, you know, the main message of that table really is, you know, a co you know common programs that are used are depleting the soil. And that's really what we kind of want to maybe put across to folks. Another point at the bottom here, don't forget sulfur. Um, sulfur, look at traditionally or not traditionally, historically would have been, would have been, we would have got it for free from the atmosphere when there was heavy industry. That has fallen away, processes have changed and there's less sulfur in the atmosphere. So for that reason, you know, when you're buying your fertilizer, especially for silage ground, um, if you can get maybe fertilizer with a bit of sulfur in it to, maybe, uh, to you know, to, to balance out the thing. 10 to 15 units per acre is, is kind of adequate for the first cut of silage. So most fertilizers will come with maybe three or five units of sulfur in the bag. And anywhere between maybe two and five units of sulfur, if you're, if you're getting it added in. Five or a ton will probably do it. Max a tenner, but I'd say five or a ton will do it in a lot of cases. Um, sulfur is very important for a few reasons. Look, we said we're not getting from the atmosphere anymore, but why it's important for a number of reasons, you're getting better use of your nitrogen and um, in, in, in the, in the, in the sward of grass and the grass plant. It'll make better use of nitrogen and it'll help as well in terms of balancing out um, maybe minerals and stuff in the silage. It'll, it'll help quality, it'll help the plant grow and it, it'll kind of, it's, it's nearly, you know, it's, it's kind of the final piece of the puzzle in balancing out the silage. Um, a health warning with all of this stuff, I suppose, and I have it here in big writing, so nobody will miss it. Don't forget, look at all of this. You know, we're trying to work within the nitrates rules and, and look at maybe if you're in glass, you might have a nutrient management plan or um, you, know, you might have one already done. Or if you don't have one done, you know, that's, that's, that'll be well worth drawing up. Um, I know we're, I think we're all supposed to have one by, you know, by, by right or by law. Um, and look, at it's, it's definitely one of the good ideas that we can do on a farm. So the kind of the third step, slurry and fertilizers on. Um, and we're saying about closing the gate, maybe just don't close it for good yet. So the third step of the process here is rolling. Or well, it's land management, but rolling is one of them. So rolling, look, rolling's a job. You can do very good work if it's done correctly, but if you're not doing it in the correct conditions, you're only creating work and, and doing harm. So look at the ideal time for rolling. It's, it's a short, it's a small window to act at it right but if you do it right look at it it's you're doing a good job so ideally you know when growth is just taken off but the grass is still short so this field here in the picture uh there's there's kind of two stripes done around the ditch um look at where there might be twigs or maybe odd stones or if, if stock took shelter or something or where a drinking trough might have been and, and a wee bit of tramping or something so uh, definitely around the ditches and look at even the whole field if it was, if, you know, if, if, uh, if, if it needed it. So when growth is taken off and grass is still short, you're doing a few jobs. Um, you're, you're doing a few jobs when, when you do it. You're leveling the field. Excuse me. You're leveling the field, number one. Um, and, and by doing that, you're, uh, you're minimizing any chance of taking soil into bales or into the pit. I suppose another part of that, or what I was saying earlier, earlier about, about doing it and doing it at the right time, ensure that you're not capping or damaging the soil. So, you know, if you're rolling and ground's too wet, you know, and, you know, surely the roller's flattening and, 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 and leveling everything out. But if the tractor wheels are doing harm into the bargain, well, look at you're, you're at nothing. You're only doing damage. So, you know, you just, you have, you have to kind of strike it just at the right time and, and just do it. You know, just do it at the right time, really. Um, into the bargain, look at you're pushing down stones. We've kind of covered that really already, but you're, and you're leveling out poaching. But as well as that, you know, in terms of the machinery coming in to make the silage, do the, you know, do the silage harvest. You're, you're, you know, getting obstacles out of the way as well. Um, so that's kind of the rolling side of it. Another part of this kind of third step is maybe controlling weeds. And look at us, we're really talking about docks, but. Um, there's there's maybe other weeds here to consider too. So weeds look at they're they're going to reduce the quality 
um, of the silage and they're going to reduce the yield as well by the fact that they're there and taking up space that maybe grass could have grown on. Um, it's kind of a straight line relationship. You know, 10% of a field covered in docks is 10% less grass. So, you know, if you're renting ground, you wouldn't like to be paying 10% more. You know, so it's, it's a fairly straightforward sum there. Look at weeds as well. They can be harmful to stock. Um, you know, in terms of look at there, there are no addition in terms of uh, there are no addition in terms of feeding quality, but you have others then that are harmful. And something that will come to mind, look at, will be something like maybe ragwort or benweeds or bohalons, depending on where you're at. Um, and look at you absolutely do not want. You know, look at that's that's basic stuff, but you absolutely do not want them. Um, but look at they can they can be harmful to stock. Uh, controlling weeds again there's there's I suppose a few reasons why we would do it in silage ground you know we've said there about the yield and the quality but as well as that the timing so late April and early May when silage ground will be closed up it's an ideal time to control weeds um, you've, you're given you know you're closing up the field for six seven eight weeks um, you have peace to do it there's going to be no stock in the field for a while um, there's, you know, you have ideal growing conditions, the, the weeds are young, and as well as that, you've put on a dollop of slurry and fertilizer to make the thing grow. So, you know, the weeds are, they're, they're prime, they're just kind of ripe for spraying or for controlling. Um, I suppose another point here, maybe on, on the kind of, on, on the IPM or integrated pest management front or reduction front, is look at, you might consider spot treatment. So, um, you know, if, if you hadn't a big weed problem, but it was only in certain areas or whatever the case, certain fields. Instead of going out with this boom sprayer here, like at the photo, you know, you might um you might consider maybe the wee the wee reel in the back here with the lance on it and, and do a bit of spot treatment. So that's that's kind of that part of it. Um so the next one I might take a wee drink here. So the fourth step of the process now is I suppose time to get the mower on. And we have a question mark as to maybe when or under what circumstances. So, you know, we've kind of said there before, but, you know, silage needing 80 to 100 units of nitrogen. A rough rule of thumb, and look at most of you, you'll know this already, you would allow roughly two units a day of nitrogen to be used up in good growing conditions. So if you had 100 units of nitrogen on, you'd allow about 50 days growing, which is, look at seven weeks in a day. Um, Again, look, it'll depend on, you know, it'll depend on growth and weather uh, all the way along, but that's, that's, that's a kind of a good rule of thumb. Monitor the crop for signs of heading out. You know, Patrick has said it there and said it very well. You know, the, the diagram there of, of, of the grass plant and, and you know, that's starting to head out. Um, you know, monitor your crop for that. You know, again, depending on what quality of silage you're going for, if you're if you're kind of looking to strike when it's just heading out, you know, um, look at you want to be keeping a sharp eye because it, it'll come along quick. If you've you know plenty of fertilizer on, good growing conditions near the longest day of the year, you know you want to be keeping a sharp eye, not you know not switching off for for ten days or a fortnight. Again, watch the weather forecast and look at observe ground conditions as well. So again, good overhead and good underneath to to get get the crop in safely and clean. A point here at the bottom is around sugars. Um, and, and look at sugar levels in the grass. There's something, look, that can be tested. You know, some feed mills or the offices here, the Jagus offices can do it. Um, you know, we can test for sugars. And, you know, depending on what level they're at, that, that's kind of a good indication whether to go ahead or not. So, you know, high sugars over 3%, that's going to make your life easy making silage. With plenty of sugar, it'll, it'll preserve. Um, if sugars are kind of in the middle here, two to three percent, maybe something like a wilt will help you out. So a bit of a wilt, you're drying out the crop and you're kind of concentrating the sugars to, to, for the silage to make. If the sugars are under two percent, you know, you're kind of, you've, you're at a bit of a crossroads. You know, if it's a case that the crop has to be harvested, um, you might consider, maybe consider wilting if you can. And if you can't, look, you might be into the territory then for maybe silage additives. Um, the key thing in all of this, you know, a lot of farmers get hung up on nitrogen levels um, and that's crack, you know, two units a day and surely two units a day is a good rule of thumb. 
But really and truly, look, if you're interested in making good silage um, and what the best operators will do, you know, they'll check out the sugars and if the sugars are good enough, they'll just go. You know, if, if you're, you know, somewhere around, as Patrick was saying there, if you're around the 6th or 7th of June, um, or you're, you know, if you're two or three days short of it or something, you know, if you can get a good wilt, that's that's going to be worth a few days' growth to you. Um, and what do you call it? If the sugars are high, you know, you're you're not you're you're not going to be up against the same problems. So, you know, really and truly, that that's a point I would like to kind of maybe hammer home. You know, if you're anywhere near the time, check the sugars, and and that's really your benchmark as to whether you cut or not. Um, you can see here in the picture, look behind. Um, I'll just put it back on. You know, when you do go cutting, in terms of uh, in terms of helping yourself out, you know, for a quick wilt, you can see the mower there. The gates are opened out, and it's sitting in wide rows. It's nearly sitting as wide as what it, you know, the, the grass cut, the grass lying cut is nearly sitting as wide as what the grass was standing. And look at you know the more surface area that's there on, on a sunny day, the better. Um, again, I suppose what I should say, and another point maybe that gets thrown up or gets laboured at times, you know, time of day. Ideally, look, if you have your own machinery sitting there, surely go and cut after dinner time um, at two or three o'clock in the afternoon when the sugars are high. We're not going to have that option all the time. You know, if you're getting a contractor, look, the windows are short, contractors are busy, you can't come to everybody at, at two or three o'clock in the day. So for that reason, you know, we would say about, about checking out the sugars um, and maybe, you know, organising a the wilt then. They're, they're going to be your friends um, and, and making silage. Um, so look at on wilting, you know, I suppose we're, we're aiming, look, for kind of 25% dry matter. So when you would cut the grass, you know, the grass standing in the field and, and the like of the kind of heat waves we had maybe a few summers ago, it might be into the twenties when it's standing before you cut it. Um, more often than not, it'll, it'll be it'll be less than that. It'll be under twenty. It'll be in the mid to high teens. You know, if your wellies are dry walking through it, you can you can maybe sure you can go ahead and cut. You know, obviously if there's water, you know, dripping dripping, you're you're going to have to wait and let it dry up a wee bit, or you know, wait to the wait to later in the day until until some of that, you know, the dew goes off it. Um, so look at Wilton, you know, maybe not cutting first thing in the morning if it is, you know, if there is a heavy dew. Wilton, what it's really doing, you're helping preservation. Um, you're helping preservation by the simple fact that because you're taking water out of the crop, the sugars have less water to travel through to preserve the silage. So, you know, you have less bulk for it to work on, you know, so anything that's smaller is going to be easier handled. So Wilton's going to help your preservation. But again, you know, common kind of, I'll not say misconceptions or I don't know what the right term is for it, but, you know, common maybe faults that are done with Wilton, farmers leave it too long in the ground. So, you know, for Wilton to kind of work properly without affecting the quality of the silage, you're looking to go for a kind of a short effect of wilt, kind of a short snappy wilt. So, you know, once grass is over 24 hours in the ground, the quality is starting to decline. Now look at, if your quality is real, you know, really super, super grass to start with, you know, that's fine. Maybe you can, you know, maybe you can lose a, a you know, a percent or two, but obviously we don't want to. But, you know, if your grass is kind of middle in quality to start with and, and you leave it lie in a couple of days, you're, you're really on the back foot, you know, and that will be a common fault with Walton farmers leaving it, you know, days on the ground. The grass is kind of respiring or breathing out. And after 24 hours, it's using energy and it's wasting energy. It's kind of burning up its own energy to, to do that. And, and you're really losing in quality. So that's kind of the message in Wilton, really. You know, if you're going to do it, you know, do it fairly quickly. Kind of 24 hours, really. Short and sharp. Another point, maybe as well, I should say before I skip on, before I forget, you know, we're saying they're aiming for 25% dry matter. You know, when you would cut grass, when you would mow it, it's probably going to be somewhere around the high teens, you know, somewhere around the high teens to twenty, maybe if you're if you're lucky. Um, you know, we're aiming for twenty five percent. It'll do that in a day, no problem if conditions are right. But you know, going above thirty percent, there's no benefit to that. You know, there's some people that can't have silage dry enough, but you know, you you know, definitely if it's going into a pit, 
you do not want that because it'll be hard to roll, hard to you know, hard to seal. Quality will drop. Um, be, you'll have air pockets. You'll be heating. You'll have you'll have plenty of problems unless you're really rallying through it. Um, and look at in bales either. You know, too dry a silage. Surely in bales it's grand, but you know you don't want it too dry either. You know, happy medium. That's the point of maybe like to make on that. Um, when, it come, when we move on to bales, geez, I'm way over time here. When you come on to bales, uh, look up, aiming for a good solid kind of a round bale sounds basic, but you know, good even rows again, fertilizer and slurry spread evenly. Um, you know, not not having it like a bad haircut that they can make an even row. Handling bales, you know, handling unwrapped bales with spikes, you're kind of driving an air pocket into the middle of the bale again, not a great idea. Um, and then again on the handling after wrapping, wrap them and stack them as soon as possible. You know, get them, get them safely into the stack without damaging them. Maybe a point worth considering is using extra wrap or even film on film, this kind of net replacement film that you see. Um, if you have very well wilted grass, um, just to kind of kind of really seal it. Um, pit silage, you know, again basic stuff, but clean out the pit properly before you go filling it. You know, so whether if the pit's empty, you know, clean clean it out to the concrete. If there's silage left over, clean off any waste. Don't be throwing on silage on top of, you know, you know, a pit that has a bit of waste on it. Clean it off. Fill it quickly and roll, you know, roll every load or roll every layer in the pit. Again, you know, self-propelled harvest, there's silage coming in at a ferocious rate. It, it's, you know, it's still the basics are there. They're important to, you know, it's important to pay attention to the basics. Um, cover it with two layers of plastic, whether it's an old cover and a new one, or cling film, whatever it might be, and weigh down the cover. And again, you know, pay particular attention to the edges of the front of the pit, anywhere there's a, anywhere there's potential for air to get in. And again, another thing, don't walk away and forget about it and go on your holidays. You know, check the cover, you know, at least once a week, maybe for a month after it, because the silage will sink. Um, right. Oh, stop. So look at in all of this, don't forget safety. You know, there's a lot of people, a lot of farm accidents, there's a lot of people killed um, at various jobs involved in the silage making process, whether it's the mixing of the slurry or the spreading. Um, you know, at that stage, you know, machinery in general, lifting bags of fertilizer, maybe loaders, leaking pipes, no check valves, all that sort of thing. Um, PTO shafts. When you move on then to bales, you know, the stacking of bales, you know, stacking them up two and three and four high with teleporters and that type of thing, you know, you really, you know, you can, you really can, I'm not saying need to know what you're doing, but you need to be careful. And as well as that covering the pit, you know, pits with no rails on them, pits that are, especially in the last few years with large herds, you know, silage pits have got way higher and look at covering those as a bit of a, maybe a safety hazard. So, um, you know, just don't forget about safety either. You know, if you'd a blade of grass never go into the pit or into a bale, you know, you would you would like to survive the year. So look at it as a wrap up. I know we're over time, sorry. You know, what have we covered? Look at Patrick has covered here, you know, decide what you want and then result you want. We want high quality and adequate quantity. You know, as good a quality as we can get, but still have enough. You know, making a plan to achieve it, estimate how much silage you need and pick your fields for the job. And like I said, you know, picking fields that'll respond to to you know, to, 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 to the fertilizer and slurry to, to have grass silage early ready. And then the last bit is put the plan into action. So, you know, all them wee things I'm after rambling about, you know, getting in there, getting at it in time, being proactive. You know, if, if, if you get the sugars tested and the silage is ready to cut and, and you're able to do it, go on ahead and cut it. You know, don't be dilly-dallying around. So, look, I think with that, I'll wrap it up and say thanks for your thanks for your time that's great kevin thanks very much um just gonna if you want to stop sharing there uh, and it will pull all of us there onto the screen that's great thanks very much so there's been a heap of questions after coming in um we have loads and loads of questions uh so what i'll do is i'll start firing them i know we're, we're pressed a bit for time but i'll start firing a few questions out there um, simple question, uh, Patrick. We'll go to you. Is is pit silage better than bales? Yeah, look at um, I, I just I was typing back answers to a few of them there as well, there, Keen. But uh, yeah. pit silage and bale silage, there, there's really no difference. It all just depends on the on on, on the on the process. Um, it should be the exact same if the air can be kept out of the grass. Um, the two should be absolutely comparable. 
Um, it's, it's all about getting the anaerobic conditions right, so getting the air out of the, out of the system. And once we can do that, there's, there's nothing to say that they shouldn't be ex- exactly the same, Keen. That's perfect. I suppose um, the, the only thing yeah, that can well, ver- vary is chop lengths. Um, look, at with bales, we're always sort of, you know, if we can get bales chopped back to about four to six inches is probably where, where, as far as we can get it. Again, look, at for, for cattle, that's sort of ideal. But going back to our sheep, the shorter the chop length we can get there, um, the, the better it's going to be for them. It'll, it'll help with intake and that as well. So that's the story there, Keen. Yeah, perfect. Um, a question come in there, Kevin. Uh, just uh, somebody here has said that they, they got some land left to them and they're wondering, is there a way of improving silage quality without spending money? So I suppose the simple question is about like what are the little things you can do you know, just to make it I Well, better? I suppose, you know, you, well, I suppose you, this question kind of covers a whole lot of stuff, but, you know, um, mm. Look at we're we're trying to cut early. We're trying to have the yield. I suppose the key thing to remember. Look at and you know P and K, unless you buy it on the gate and fertilizer, it's not going to appear magically. So you know if you've slurry and dung already, you're looking to make use of them, um, and maybe concentrate them in those areas and to have them g'd up that you're able to cut. You know at, at the start of June or end of May. Yeah. Um, you know if soil fertility is low in a case like that. Lime definitely will unlock whatever's there. Um, and you're really looking then at what you have in terms of slurry and dung. But, you know, that's kind of part of the reason to put up, you know, those fertilizer programs. Look, at P and K is not going to magically mm. lear up your farm lane. You know. No, it, it, it just, but, uh, but as regards, let's say, uh, maybe go in, so somebody, as regards grazing or maybe the cutting date, do you know, neither of them are. I uh, will getting it, getting it grazed off. Um, look, at maybe grazing off even the back end with sheep or something, or, you know, up to Christmas time. Or look at if you have if you have good dry land, you can get cattle out early or windland and clean it. Great too, but um, you know, get, getting it cleaned off with with whatever is available. Say you could set a run for sheep or something, and and you know get a few pound for it if you if you didn't if they're just fenced and you didn't have sheep, um, and then cutting it, really yeah. getting getting set up on that front. Yeah, that's great. Um, another simple question come in there about. The roller was mentioned, but the chain harrow wasn't. And just how beneficial is a chain harrow? Uh, maybe Patrick, you'll have. Just yeah, look that. at the uh, t- two two important tools. Look at I suppose maybe where farmyard manure was spread earlier in the spring or in, in the back end of the year, the chain harrow can be very beneficial there to break that up. And also I suppose maybe if there's poaching to level it out. But I suppose that the roller does another job in itself where there's stones and maybe bits of twigs or or, or, or around hedges or that. The roller compacts them down too, but I suppose the chain arrow will level the field and break up manure without actually um without actually co- compacting the field. So um look at the two of them have a have a place and a purpose there, Keen. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, I come back to you, Kevin, on this, or uh, either you can come in uh, if you you feel something is relevant. Um, where somebody has tested the field, uh, t- taken their soil sample and it's come up in P and K, like what should be the approach? For that, if it's a high in P and high in K, good figures in both. What that's showing up maybe this index year, or maybe beyond this year. Then how should they handle that? That's showing up maybe index four or something, mm-hmm. is it? Yes, uh, uh, index four P and K. Yeah. Right, right. Well, I suppose the the line in that would be maybe to use something like straight nitrogen. If it is index four, would be the would be the recommendation. And I suppose the key thing there, if it if it's you know if it's ground, look that you're if you're cutting twice and you're taking a lot off it, that's maybe something that's a field of soil sample again mm-hmm. next year. Silage ground, there's a big flow of nutrients. You know, the key thing as well, you have a large flow of nutrients on to grow it, but you have a large offtake as well. When you go in with the mower and you shave the field, you're taking everything that that field has has you know given you. You're you're drawing it out the gate. You know, a few animals grazing, like maybe background here, they're recycling it. But once you mow it, it's all out the gate. So that's a field that would be keeping a sharp eye on. Straight nitrogen for now, keep a sharp eye yeah. on. It. Yeah, that's perfect. And another question, and probably the polar opposite of it, is somebody has said, no, I won't go into the full details on it, but they, they put on um, muriate of potash, so uh, 50 units or whatever in the back end, and then they put on some DAP at this point. So that would have 46, I think, uh, phosphorus into it. They're wondering, yeah. uh, have they now enough P and K on the soil without slurry? Uh, do you want to just... Maybe mention about the use. They probably will dap by dap. Uh, look at dap. I think it's eighteen twenty zero would be the would be the the, the compound of it here. Mm. Um, 
look, they're probably not far away if they're using something like, you know, that they probably would, would maybe be able to use something to cut sward there. A few bags of cut sward, they're not going to be adding on a wild lot of pee onto it, um, onto the top of that. Um, look at if the soil samples are going to have to maybe pay attention to those as well or a nutrient management plan, but um, DAP 20 and 50, yeah. they're, they're, they're well on their way with. Um, was the P and the K? They probably need to top it up. So yeah, well, that was, that was uh, sorry when I mentioned that is that uh, actually they had the DAP on plus a little bit of 10, 10, 20 was actually what they had mentioned. So oh, right, well, that's a different story yeah. then. No, well, they're probably yeah. they're probably coming back closer to I'll say nit- high nitrogen compounds and very little P and K. Yeah, that's I suppose to talk to some you know calculate it back or speak to their their advisor might be the the, the best thing when dealing with those high levels of of particularly with phosphorus yeah um let me see uh i'll just go back here to another one on this um if i graze my silage ground early spring can i let my cutting date run on further than the 20th of may and still get quality do you want to uh, yeah i, I can yeah. take that one there keen well look i suppose um it, it's going to be a help it definitely is going to be a help by, by grazing your silage ground um, having it clean before you go putting out slurry and fertilizer, um, it's it's probably it could benefit you up to anywhere about five percent uh, DMD. But I suppose the um grass is naturally going to going to go through the reproductive cycle. Or it's going to it's going to start putting out a seed head coming into early June. Look at I suppose if we've reseeded and we have kept heading dates together and stuff with late heading varieties, we might be able to push it out a wee bit, but. You know, grass follows 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 a pattern and follows nature, and it's naturally going to try and head out around um head out around 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 early June anyway. So it's there's, there's not much we can do there, you know. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, either you can come in on this one. Uh, it's just about a query on if if somebody hadn't spread lime in the previous autumn, and a lot of guys are going to be out taking soil samples at this time of year, and it's going to come back with a lime requirement. Um. What is the shortest time between spreading lime and cutting grass for silage? Should they be going out now with lime? Like, what what should they do? It's probably look at us. Probably a borderline to risky enough one. Um, you know, I think this time last year the weather just took up and we hadn't hardly a shower of rain from from St Patrick's Day until you know until June basically. So no, and that and, you know it's it's a bit risky. Um. Basically, what happens with lime, um, if you're putting on your two tonne to the acre or whatever, if that's not washed in, if it's not on long enough in advance, there's a danger that when you come along to mow the silage, you know, the, the mower is kind of like a nearly a, a kind of a suction action or, a, you know, creates a bit of a, a vacuum, if you like, and you're, you're sucking up kind of, you know, fine bits of lime that haven't been washed in. And, you know, if that, if that comes into a bale or into the pit, you know, you're trying to preserve silage and, and get it acidic quickly. Whereas lime is the opposite, and you basically you'll have you'll have you could open a bale as green as you bailed it. Um, it won't basically preserve. You could affect preservation in a big way. So, and that's sort of a case. Look at you might have an argument there for spreading something like bag lime. If the land really needs lime, you could make an argument for it there. I would be advising caution on putting on ground limestone lorry lorry a lorry load of lime now at this stage. Yeah, that's probably, perfect. Probably veer yeah. against it to be straight with you. Another question has come in there. Um, uh, would you put on a bit of early fertilizer for grazing, um, and then go with the silage fertilizer when it's cleaned off? You could do. Well, some folks there maybe would put on maybe their half bag urea, um, maybe in the months of February or whenever the thing is right, um, and maybe even get a grazing or something out of it. But really, the 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 kind of the, the thinking on that is to discount two thirds of that. Then, so when you close up, if you put on your twenty three units of urea, we'll say. You would discount maybe sixteen of that, um, when you would come to top it up for silage. Yep, that's perfect. Just adjust the the figure down slightly. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. And there, there's a couple of questions here on about minerals and um, about the worry that soft that applying sulfur might tie up copper. And again, there's another question about molybdenum, but we're back to copper again. Mm. You know, just how to maybe how to handle that, or or what should be done if there's an issue on either one. I uh, will look at molybdenum. Um, definitely look at if there's if there's high rates of lime going on um, in the recent past. 
definitely with grazing animals, um, you can run into problems with the in them. There's not really a whole lot you're going to be able to do with it in terms of silage. You know, if it's a grazing situation, you'll be supplementing animals with copper. Again, with a, in a silage situation, like you want to get the yield of silage. Um, and look at sulfur. Look at unless you overcook it with sulfur, you know, 10 to 15 units is kind of the recommended. Um, if, if you're going way over that, look at you can run yourself into problems. There's no point in saying otherwise. Um, but putting on that amount, it's, it's a safe amount. Like it's not, you know, it's, we're recommending to put it on. It's not, um, if anything, putting on sulfur is going to help balance it out. If anything. Um, overdoing it, like anything, isn't isn't going to help you. But putting on the right amount, no, I would have no, I would have no issue with putting that on. You know, it's it's really you're you're come back to your animals then. Do you need to be supplementing them? Is there is there an underlying issue or something? Yeah, look, that, that that's great, uh, Kevin. Um, just looking at the time, there we're heading for ten past nine. I know we've overrun and we haven't got anywhere near. I don't remember the last time we had this many questions. We've had a huge number of questions have come in over the course of the last hour. So I think we may start to wrap things up. Um, so that's more or less it for this evening. Uh, next week, we're moving on to another, again, very important topic and it's education. Uh, what are the benefits and what are my options? Uh, and just given it's about education, uh, if you know anyone that it might interest, please feel free, please feel free to share the details of it. Um, and you can sit, share it on then if it's on social media or whatever the case is. And you'll get all details of this and any other events uh, in this region in Chagas Slagalitrum Donegal by following Chagas SLD Slagalitrum Donegal on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and so on. Um, thanks to Patrick and Kevin for the presentations. Thanks to you all for joining us this evening. That's it for this evening. Stay safe and good night. Thanks, Cheers, Steve. folks. <laughs>